Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, Double CCA and Cisco Press author. And in this video, you're going to learn about wireless LAN security. And by the way, this video is actually a sample video for my brand new video course entitled Network Plus N10-007 Complete Video Course. So stay tuned. In this video, we want to talk about the need for network security when it comes to wireless networks. And we want to talk about how we can provide that wireless network security. Think about it. We've got a big corporate building. We've got wireless access points all over the place giving us great coverage. In fact, some of the coverage goes outside of the building. If we don't have that network secured, it's essentially like putting an Ethernet port in the parking lot where somebody could just drive up and start listening in on all the Wi-Fi traffic. And here's a term for you. You might have heard of war dialing. Remember the movie War Games? Matthew Broderick's character had his computer and his modem, his dial-up modem, dial a whole bunch of local numbers in an attempt to find what numbers answered. In other words, what numbers were connected to other modems that he could try to get into. Well, that was called war dialing. Well, now there's something called war driving where people can literally drive around and try to find active wireless access points that they can get into because that wireless access point is not secured. So we definitely want to provide security for our corporate wireless networks. And we've got a couple of main goals when we're doing this. The first goal is authentication. We want to make sure the user is who they claim to be. To do that, they could provide some credentials maybe a username and a password combination. Maybe we could authenticate them off of something like a Microsoft Active Directory database. We also want to provide encryption. We want to scramble the packets up in such a way if a malicious user were to capture those packets, they wouldn't be able to do anything with those packets. They couldn't understand them because the packets were all jumbled up and they could not be put back together again. So let's take a look at some tools now for better securing a wireless network. One tool is MAC filtering. This is where you can have a database of allowed MAC addresses on the network. This can be programmed manually where you have a database saying these specific MAC addresses can get on the network and nobody else can. Or this could happen dynamically. I think I may have shared with you in another video. I was recently on, on a cruise ship and we bought the Wi-Fi access package to get to the internet while we were there. And I had both a phone and a laptop that I wanted to get on the internet at different times but they only gave us one MAC address per stateroom. And I had already got my phone on the network, so their database had learned my phone's MAC address, and that meant when I tried to get my laptop on, it wouldn't allow it using my credentials, using my username and password, because I already had my one MAC address consumed. Well, what I did was I copied down the MAC address from my phone and shut my phone off, and then went into my laptop and I statically told the laptop, hey, here is your MAC address. And it was the MAC address for the phone. So I sort of followed their rules. I only had one device on the network at any one time, but by changing the MAC address on my laptop, I was able to get more than one device on total. And that's an illustration of why MAC filtering is not all that secure, because we can go into our devices oftentimes and statically set the MAC address. Something else we could do is called geofencing. This can use the GPS location service inside of many of our mobile devices. And we could say, if somebody wanders outside of this area with their mobile device, no longer is that device going to be able to get on the corporate network. Or if we're wandering between departments in a large corporate building, perhaps, we suddenly wandered into the research and development department, suddenly, nope, you're not allowed to access this network. And based on our geolocation, maybe we're prevented from getting access to the internet. But a big focus of this video is going to be on protocols that provide security for a wireless network. When the IEEE 802.11 standard came out, it did include a security standard. However, it wasn't very good. It was called WEP, W-E-P, Wired Equivalent Privacy. And by the name, you might think that this is going to give me an equivalent level of privacy, of security, that I would have with a wired connection. Unfortunately, that's not true. It was the standard that was originally specified, but it is considered to be very, very weak. It uses an encryption algorithm called RC4, sometimes pronounced ARC4. Now, by the way, RC doesn't stand for something technical. If you go back and look at the history of this, RC is for a Vietnam road named RC4. It was Route Colonel 4. And well, for whatever reason, that was the name of this protocol, but RC does not stand 
or something security related. It's the name of a road in Vietnam. And RC4 or ARC4 if you prefer, it uses something called an initialization vector or an IV. And here's where a big part of the weakness comes in. Now, the idea of having an IV, an initialization vector, is a good one. The idea is we're going to add an initialization vector to data so that the same plain text data frame is never going to produce the same WEP encrypted data frame. The challenge with this IV, though, is it's transmitted in plain text. This means that if an attacker captures enough packets, and all these packets have the same WEP key, there's a way to mathematically determine what the WEP key is. In fact, there's a utility freely available on the internet that can do this for us. It's called AirSnort. So RC4 is not considered to be very good encryption because it's fairly trivial for a determined attacker to get the WEP key. As part of the WEP standard though, there are two types of authentication that are specified, and I'd want you to know these. The first type is open authentication. This might be what you have in a coffee shop or a restaurant or an airport. This is where you are not required to log in to the wireless network to get access to the internet. However, if you do have, and we're probably not using WEP keys these days, but when it was in more widespread use, we'll say, if you provided a valid WEP key, then it would be accepted by the wireless access point and you would get access to the network as well, but your packets would be encrypted because you provided a key. We weren't requiring a key, it was open, but if you provided a key, that would give you the extra benefit of encryption. The other authentication type is shared. This is where wireless clients and wireless access points, they were pre-configured with a key. Sometimes that's called a pre-shared key because the configuration was done manually beforehand. And speaking of how keys are distributed, let's take a look at the two primary modes of key distribution. One we just talked about. The first one is a pre-shared key or a PSK mode. Sometimes this is also referred to as personal mode. This is where we pre-configure our wireless devices with the same key. That key is used in the encryption algorithm to scramble up the data. So if somebody were to intercept the data, they wouldn't be able to read it because they don't have that pre-shared key. And once both the client and the access point have that key, then that data can be sent between those devices encrypted. Our other mode of operation is called enterprise mode. In enterprise mode, we're a lot more scalable, as the name suggests. Here, the clients can provide their authentication credentials to a server, an authentication server. Typically, it's a radius server, and that can permit or deny the client to access the network. And if the client is permitted, it can say, while you're on the network, this is the temporary key you're going to be using just for this one time, just for this session. The authentication server gives a session key to both the client and to the wireless access point. In fact, this is known as 802.1x. The big three players in 802.1x is we have a supplicant, a device that's asking for permission to get on the network, an authenticator, which is going to have a secured connection with the client once the client is authenticated, and the authentication server, typically a radius server, that's going to receive credentials from the client, and only then will the client be allowed on the network. That radius server or the authentication server is going to hand out a session key to both the client and to the authenticator. Now, here's a paradox. We might think, okay, by default, the supplicant is not allowed through the access point to get on the wired network, but it has to get on the wired network in order to communicate with the authentication server. How is that possible? Well, the way it works is there's an exception, and the exception is if we're sending an authentication request to this authentication server, that is the only type of traffic that the authenticator, or the access point in this case, will allow to get onto the wired network. And assuming this client provided valid credentials, the authentication server can give a key. It's a matching key, but it's only good for the session, so we call it a session key. It gives a copy of that session key to both the client and to the authenticator. So for your home network, you might be using personal mode or PSK mode. But for your corporate environment where users are coming and going and people are coming into the company and leaving the company, you might want to use enterprise mode because here, instead of having to have a key that you give out to everyone, you can have user accounts on an authentication server and just add and delete user accounts to give those users access to the network. But remember we were saying that WEP, the security standard that came in the original 802.11 standard, 
was not very secure, well, let's talk about some enhanced security protocols. One big improvement over WEP is TKIP, which stands for Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. This has vastly better encryption compared to RC4. For one thing, it uses something called key hashing, so each packet can have its own seed value. In other words, a master key is derived on the server and the client, and this master key is used to generate the keys used during the session. The initialization vector that we talked about earlier, it was expanded. This reduces the occurrence of what we call collisions. A collision happens when the same initialization vector is reused, which is a weakness that utilities like AirSnort exploit. It can also use broadcast key rotation, which makes the key change so quickly that an attacker wouldn't have time to learn that key and exploit it before a new key is generated. Another enhanced security protocol is MIC, Message Integrity Check. This can help protect against things like a man-in-the-middle attack or a replay attack. For example, if I have access to traffic within a SSID within a wireless network, if I capture that traffic and think, well, this person got on the network and they were authenticated using this information that I just captured, I'm just going to play that back to the wireless network and it's going to let me in. Now, this is going to protect against things like that from happening. And sometimes an attacker will do what's called an inductive attack. They will send strings of data into the network to see how the network encrypted those strings of data. And if it does that enough, it can start to notice some patterns. And based on those patterns, it can try to determine what the key is. Well, this helps protect against that type of thing. And while TKIP was a big improvement over ARC4 or RC4, an improvement over TKIP is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Now, typically in wireless networks, this is used 128-bit keys. It's better than TKIP, and it's way better than RC4. But typically, we don't see AES used by itself. It's used in conjunction with something called Counter Mode with a Cipher Block Chaining Message Authentication Code. Wow, that's a long name, but we can abbreviate that by saying CCMP. And this takes advantage of AES's very powerful encryption algorithm, but it makes it more challenging for a malicious user to spot repeated sequences that we were talking about earlier. And it also adds to the encryption of AES, it also adds hashing, where we're making sure that messages have not been modified in transit. And these protocols helped enhance what we could do with wireless network security as opposed to what we could do with WEP. In fact, these protocols led to some other wireless security standards. Let's consider some of those. To make up for some of the limitations in WEP, WPA was introduced, and that stands for Wi-Fi Protected Access. Instead of using RC4 for encryption, it's going to use TKIP for enhanced encryption. The initialization vector that WEP used, well, it's longer with WPA. That reduces the occurrence of those collisions we were talking about. Unfortunately, it does have a security weakness that's been discovered. It's not really considered to be a secure protocol any longer. It's not recommended that we use it. And a replacement for WPA came along, and it was WPA2, the second version of WPA. This enhances encryption by not using TKIP. It uses AES in combination with CCMP that we talked about a moment ago. However, here's some late-breaking news for you. After CompTIA had published the exam objectives for this version of the exam, the N10-007 exam, in late 2017, a pretty severe vulnerability was found with WPA2 where people could take advantage of that. So it also has a discovered security weakness. But if you look at the topics you have to know for the current Network Plus exam, you're going to see that WPA is on there, but WPA3 is not. That's a new player. It just came on the scene in early 2018, and it was announced as a replacement for WPA2, now that there's this weakness in WPA2. Now, obviously, it's going to take a while to catch on, as equipment's going to have to have WPA3 added to it. Not everything is going to support WPA3 for some time, probably, but it is going to be the replacement for WPA2. This is just a real-world tip for you. This is not exam-relevant at this point, because it's not even on the exam blueprint, because it came out after the exam blueprint. But instead of using the 128-bit key that WPA2 used for AES, WPA3 uses a 192-bit encryption key. 
And WPA3 is not just more secure, it can help us with the adoption of Internet of Things devices like refrigerators and security cameras we have around our homes and doorbells and things like that. Things that don't have a display. It's going to be easier, so the developers say, to add those types of devices to a wireless network. And remember we talked about a couple of different ways of letting a user get on the network. We could pre-configure their laptop or their device with a key that was already shared with a wireless access point, but we said that didn't scale very well. We said if we had a large enterprise environment and users were coming and going, it would be much easier just to keep user accounts on an authentication server and we could add and delete user accounts very easily as compared to replacing the keys on all these devices. But we need to dig a little bit deeper into the behind the scenes of how that works. There are some specific protocols that dictate exactly how do we do that? How does this 802.1x authentication work? So let's talk about extensible authentication protocols. Remember what's happening here. We've got a supplicant that is communicating with the authentication server asking permission to get on the network. If it provides valid credentials, the authentication server is going to give a session key to both the supplicant, the client or the mobile device, and it's going to provide a session key to the wireless access point. But there are some very specific standards that say how those keys are handed out and how that supplicant gets authenticated. And I want you to know a few of these that CompTIA has specifically identified. The first one is EEP TLS, Extensible Authentication Protocol Transport Layer Security. This was one of the original authentication methods that was defined as part of the IEEE 802.1x standard. And here, both our end users and our RADIUS servers, they're going to be able to authenticate one another by using one another's digital certificates. Of course, if we use digital certificates, that's going to require another service that we add to the network. We're going to have to have some sort of CA, a certificate authority, that's going to be the trusted third party that signs, or in other words, encrypts those certificates. So it's a little bit complex to set up since we have to add this PKI, or this certificate authority infrastructure. However, it does allow a user to log in with their Microsoft Active Directory credentials. Another extensible authentication protocol I want you to know is called EAP. FAST, Extensible Authentication Protocol, Flexible Authentication via Secure Tunneling. Here, a client has something called a Protected Access Credential, or a PAC, and it's going to use this Protected Access Credential to request access to the network. And this network access can happen either in two phases or three phases. Here's what I mean. Phase zero, which is optional, this is what happens if a client's PAC is dynamically configured as opposed to us manually configuring it. If we manually configure it, then phase zero doesn't exist. But if it's dynamic, we do have a phase zero. Then phase one, this is where the client and the AAA server, they use that PAC to establish a TLS tunnel between themselves, a transport layer security tunnel. And then once that tunnel is established, the client's going to send user information across that tunnel. And one more extensible authentication protocol for you, and it's, <laughs> this is a fun one to say, it's PEEP, the Protected Extensible Authentication Protocol. This was developed by Microsoft and Cisco and RSA, and the goal is we want to protect the authentication transaction by using, similar to what we talked about earlier, a TLS connection. And there are two main flavors of PEEP implementations. The first one is called PEEP version 0, also known as EEP. MS CHAP version 2. Now, this is the one that's the most widely supported. We can use Microsoft's Active Directory to store user credentials, and that can be used to authenticate users. The implementation that's not as widely seen is PEEP version 1, also known as EEP GTC, where GTC stands for Generic Token Card. Here, we can use generic databases, like OTP, One-Time Password Databases, or LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol Databases for authentication. Now, here's what I find really strange. Notice that one of the developers of PEEP is Microsoft, but Microsoft has never added support for PEEP in any of their major operating systems. And that might be why PEEP version 0 is the predominant version of PEEP that we see today. And that is a somewhat lengthy look in this video at why we need wireless network security. We talked about the need to provide authentication and encryption. We talked about different encryption standards and how RC4 was weak and TKIP was better and AES was even better than that. We talked about how we could have personal mode or pre-shared key mode for our wireless networks. Or we could have enterprise mode where we have an authentication server and that's going to be done with 802.1x 
And 802.1x used some flavor of EEP, some flavor of an extensible authentication protocol. And we talked about EEP TLS, EEP Fast, and PEEP. <laughs>